free speech is a boring cliche. No, it doesn't exist in China because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Explain myself. I'm aware of the effect of what about is on. So what I'm about to say is to just make a point and I'll move on to China. There's cancel culture, banning critical race theory in the classroom, internet crackdown on the Capitol Hill protest, arresting 56 journalists in 2021, political correctness, virtual signaling. Oh, here's a good one. Donald Trump Twitter account. I'm not encouraging judgment here. I'm only normalizing a political reality most people don't recognize. Free speech doesn't exist when it is inconvenient for the authority, who has every incentive to control the public discourse in order to safeguard its point of view and position. However, I do acknowledge that there are some question marks around the extent of China's censorship system. So, for example, from having built the most sophisticated filtering system to excluding foreign websites like Google, Facebook, and Instagram, China's censorship just seems a little bit too intense. For those of you who were so on the idea that free speech doesn't exist, might come to the next conclusion that, all right, this is not about having the perfect free speech. This is about control within limits. The less, the better. So let's reframe our question as to why is the Chinese authority so nervous about the internet? In this video, I'm going to put everything in context and explain the logic behind China's gigantic censorship system and the root cause of why China doesn't want to back down despite it has been blasted with criticisms. In the end, I'm going to have a little chat with you about the national security law in Hong Kong that bans pro-democracy speech and booksellers. Without further ado, let's go. I'm going to take you back to the time between 2010 and 2013, the time of two watershed moments that determined China's worldview on the internet. In December 2010, a Tunisian food seller named Mohamed Brazizi set himself on fire at the edge of despair after the police confiscated his merchandise. What followed was an eruption of widespread discontent against the Ben Ali government that had failed to address the raging employment and social inequality. Despite the government trying to shut down the internet, extensive information was disseminated around the world about the victim, along with demands for punishment. More and more complaints about the government were posted. Finally, through the help of social media, people took their complaints to the street. The government fell. Ben Ali fled the country. In three months' time, the protests spread to the rest of the Middle East to countries like Libya, Egypt and Syria where people organized civil movement through social media to subvert the government. While the Western audience interpret this as a courageous push for democratic ways of life, day after day, week after week, until a dictator of more than two decades finally left power. Unfortunately, the Chinese government see this instead as a seed to incite civil war and stage revolutionary changes to China's hard-earned stability. You probably guess what direction I'm leading you to. But there's a cultural difference here between the West and China, and it lies in the vibe between people and the government. In a traditional Western democracy, as some of you already know, what people celebrate about living in a good society is having pluralism, different ways for people to channel discontent and voice different interests. People should be allowed to form social groups and even political associations in parallel with the government. For example, groups like NGOs, women organizations, lobbyists, trade unions, and grassroots movements like Black Lives Matter and the Me Too protest. I have a dream. In the UK, there have already been a few rounds of strikes at universities and railway stations. There is this environment of counterculture, antagonism, and political activism that's almost enshrined as an act of virtue. This vibe is called civil society. The authority doesn't usually see it as a threat because there's a deep consensus by both parties that the purpose is to influence public policies than to challenge the legitimacy of the government. Whereas in China, people and government just have a different kind of chemistry. Stretching as far back as to Imperial China, what Chinese people celebrated about living in a good society was instead 
unification and having order. I must emphasize the continuity between Imperial China and contemporary China because despite the turmoil that China went through over the last hundred years, traditions were still preserved and passed down from generations in written forms and social customs. Unification means unity in geography, politics, thoughts and ethnicities. To translate this into real life, it means people should all identify themselves as one Chinese people to live in harmony with one another and to avoid extremes and contradictions. In the past, that was always the prerequisite for any emperor to hold his mandate of heaven. The only time when the government saw a riot or a mass movement was the time when it saw the end of its days, when it hadn't done its job providing the basic necessities for its people, like what happened in the Arab Spring. But time is different now. In the modern China, where the government wears its 800 million people lifted out of poverty as a big badge of honor, the idea of having an ever-present antagonistic group that fans up public rhetoric about Taiwan and Tibet and having another competing party was a very unwelcomed prospect. The speed and the influence of the internet, as shown in the Arab Spring, has worsened this fear of losing unity and order. I know at this point some people were like, oh, you're just talking the theories here. Let's fast forward to 2013. Three years after the Arab Spring, Snowden revealed to the world that America's National Security Agency had been working with the UK, Australia, Canada and New Zealand as the Five Eyes to spy on the rest of the world. And they're getting everyone's calls, everyone's call records, um, and everyone's internet traffic as well. The US government co-opts uh, US corporate power to its own ends. Companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, they all get together with the NSA and provide the NSA direct access to the back ends of all of the systems you use to communicate, to store data, to put things in the cloud, and, and even just to, to send birthday wishes and keep a record of your life. The verdict was reached. China believes that the West, especially America, including its private companies and organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy, can never be trusted. Just to be fair here, this sentiment is kind of similar to how the US now feels about China's Huawei. In this case, China became convinced that the Western organizations like Facebook and Twitter were backed up by the US government, playing a black hand at encouraging subversive movements in the third world, particularly through providing financial and technical support to pro-democracy, anti-government activists. Interesting enough, this has been admittedly reported by the New York Times. The United States democracy building campaigns played a bigger role in fomenting protest than was previously known. A number of the groups and individuals directly involved in the revolts and reforms sweeping the region received training and financing from groups like the International Republic Institute, the National Democratic Institute and Freedom House. Here is China's reaction to this. Quoting the Global Times, a Chinese state media. Instead of launching military operations directly in the name of democracy, the US prefers to use color revolutions as a tool to intervene in other countries' internal affairs, to subvert governments in order to reinforce its global control, which the US has found more efficient and economical. As to how China feels about this, quote, however, what color revolutions left in their wake are neither peace nor Western democracy, but mass confusion, chaos, and destruction in the target countries. This also confirmed China's suspicion about the free speech narrative concerning the internet. China finds it invariably a convenient tool for the West to advance its political agenda through infiltrating its ideologies into weaker states. An unregulated and unmonitored internet 
if put in practice, would be in fact a very effective tool to introduce inflammatory narratives to overturn a government the West doesn't like. So to introduce the firewall and to shut down some of its internet is just to make sure that it doesn't happen. Now, what will be a very meaningful question to ask at this point is whether this claim by China is just a paranoia about losing control or is it actually based in some kind of reality? It might be worth looking into the climate of the global news media, like the kind of environment China finds itself in. According to a study done by the Ipsos, among the most influential international news brands to affluent audiences, 8 out of 10 come from the US and the UK. Particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, CNN and BBC are the leaders, taking up 36% and 27% of reach, respectively, far ahead of the more neutral Channel News Asia of Singapore, which only has 14% of reach. That said, China recognised the hardcore reality that the West is still in a dominant position in shaping the global discourse. This imbalance of power had been studied by a Finnish social scientist called Carly Nordenstrom, who argued that globally, the inflow of information between states, not least the material pumped out by television, is to a very great extent one way unbalanced traffic and in no way processes the depth and the range which the principles of freedom of speech require. The developing countries, he said, are at the mercy of information exports by the industrialized Western countries, the great powers in particular. Needless to say, English or the English ways of looking at the world has absolute monopoly over how a culture or any culture is understood on a global scale. Now that the West see China as a political rival, China now understand the internet as a sphere for cultural war where America, as well as its ally, are committed to taking full advantage of the power of its media to portray China in a negative light. China believes that sometimes they do so at the cost of spreading fear-mongering misinformation to tarnish China's reputation, as well as penetrating China's domestic public discourse. According to Harvard Kennedy School, by 2016, more than 90% of the Chinese people have good opinions of their central government. So banning foreign websites is just a least bad strategy for China to protect its people from losing their fair opinions of the government simply because of a well-crafted yet mean-intended narrative they heard online. Unfortunately, China hasn't got the power to change that yet. Where's my water? So that is China's censorship story. <laughs> Do you still want me to talk about Hong Kong? All right, I'll be real quick. In three sentences, how's that? China enforced the national security law in Hong Kong because it recognized the West to have more cultural influence. So banning pro-democracy, aka anti-Beijing rhetoric and booksellers is to protect China's political order and the national unity. So Chinese people in Hong Kong identify with China, not with the West. Huh? For the last few months, I have received so many thoughtful and well-written comments from you. So I want to say a big thank you to you. And similarly, if you have any comments or constructive criticisms, feel free to write them with as many details as you would like. I always read them. If you find this video helpful or, dare I say, satisfying to watch, I would love it if you could support this video by liking and subscribing if you haven't and share this link with a friend that you have been maybe debating this with. It really helps with the algorithm and the promotion. Anyhow, I appreciate you either way. Thank you so much for staying and I will let you go for now and I will see you in the next one.